Everybody, thanks for joining. This is the Microsoft Community Office Hours and a cast of thousands, as you can see here. Um, formerly live. And uh, yeah, we're yeah formerly live uh, event. We are, uh, we so we switched things up. So we shut down the evening session because Eric wasn't with us and why life is not worth living if Eric's not participating. So uh, uh, my ego. <laughs> wow. But we've stretched this out to 90 minutes. We'll get through as many questions as we're able to get through that have been posted out on the Office 365 and Microsoft Teams communities, as well as Microsoft Tech community, and uh, provide some nominal value to someone out there, maybe. That's the goal, is to maybe help someone. There are a lot of people in the world, statistically speaking, somebody yeah. should be helped. <laughs> you could have just paused that. There are a lot of people, statistically speaking. <laughs> Yeah, but you know our mission, correct. our mission statement, which isn't That's, written anywhere. Oh yeah, to to maybe help someone somewhere at some yeah, point. I'm thinking that is that is good. Now we need the theme music, Eric. We were talking about needing to have some kind of bumper music for the beginnings. I was thinking like '80s hair metal type thing and come in and. Of course you were. Does not. Why does that not surprise anybody? <laughs> uh, sure. All right. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Any homework we want to uh, report on? Uh, I had homework, but it's as of now complete because I was busy working on the presentation I'm going to give right after this. Oh, so. Well, I had uh, so I did a bunch of research uh, around the question uh, around um, uh, the praise capability within Microsoft Teams. And I talked to people much smarter than me on this topic. Yes. <laughs> um, and they were stumped by a few things as well. Here's what we learned. So it, what we're talking about now, of course, there are third party praise tools that are available that provide leaderboards and other capability. Most people, when they're looking at what's done, some of the gamification capabilities over in Yammer, they're asking, you know, uh, not surprisingly, hey, when are we going to be able to do some of the same things over within Teams or even more so, hey, Microsoft, any chance we can do some of these things and combine the data between the two? And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, but some clarification, when you use the out-of-the-box praise app that comes inside of Microsoft Teams, uh, it shows up as a message type it is not then presented anywhere. There is no summary data of praise message types anywhere. Does it show up in Delve? It only shows up in the message, whether it's in a chat or it's within uh, uh, the, the threaded discussion. Are However, you saying it's empty praise? Yes, it is, empty praise. Um, so, <laughs> Mike and I are right. <laughs> uh, that, that's good. Um, that is yeah, so Microsoft. So it is, so it is being <laughs> captured. So I was talking with John White, who, as most of us know, uh, our CTO over at, you know, MVP, dual MVP now, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, over right. at Tigraph. And he was able to go in and sent me some screenshots like, yep, yeah, here it is. Here's the message type. The data is captured. So if you have a developer, want to go build something, it's captured within the Graph API. You can go and report on and do something around that. Um, so I, I'm i trying to uh, encourage uh, Tigraph for some new product expansion and add some feature capability. Because again, for organizations that use Yammer, it's an important metric to track. And for a manager to be able to go in and look at an individual's profile or look at a team profile and look at the number of praise, especially if you customize the praise tools. If you build a methodology around, uh, you know, employee like peer recognition program, you want to be able to have those leader boards and kind of show different things. sales organizations. It's a big deal to be able to go in that and, and track those, the, the kudos or the win that a managers give out every time a sale is closed or, a, a customer calls in with, you know, great feedback for that that sales interaction, um, but there's just nothing out of the box today. I was surprised. I, I just assumed it was somewhere, and we, you know, it, like somebody had suggested out in the interwebs, 
Oh yeah, it's up on the Delve profile. Like, no. Nope. And I would suggest that also they could use it for pulling in badges that uh, they post to, because Microsoft Tech Community Forums is also right. has a, its own API. Right. So you can pull the badges in from there as well. Well, that's the that's the thing. There's other uh, so there's about a dozen or more different. I've pulled in links for some, so I'm still working on. Uh, a, a blog post for this. So John and I, I've got some questions still that we're trying, we're investigating. Um, but some of the requests are around those custom badging. So it's exactly that. So there's the praise capability that you want to have also as part of the profile, the badges, third-party badges, external <laughs> badges. Um, there's requests. I mean, there's been for years for LinkedIn to be able to recognize some of that badging, badging cap capability. I think they've done. I think you can now go and create custom I badges. I don't think you can. Okay. There's been talk about it, but yeah, it's not something I've been out there and pursuing. But I know that uh, we you know, to complete a course, and of course we all see people sharing um, when they've completed a certification or some kind of program, kind of the image. But that's kind of the same as the praise within Teams. It's just an image shared within a message that's posted there's no tracking of that badge. So it would be the ability to have on your personal profile for managers to be able to build that off of that leaderboards, tracking of that capability. Because think about that, if, you, if you're if you using Pluralsight and some other internal education tools, um, like, you know, like Visual SP and you complete courses or Microsoft certifications, me as a manager would have to go manually add in badges and profiles and track all that stuff. I just want to have that automated. If they complete that successfully, pass the exam, they're awarded the badge, it shows up in their profile, and that whether their LinkedIn page or their profile out on Teams. Uh, and then as as team members are, you know, giving Eric kudos for being on time for a call, he hasn't received one yet. But when he receives one, for that to show prominently on his profile, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it, Eric? You know, I'm feeling really good about tonight's call. So we'll just have to see how that works out. <laughs> yeah. Tonight's call that isn't happening. I feel good too. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Do we get uh, badges? Yeah. Christian, do we what? get badges? Do we get do we badges? Get, we don't need no stinking badges, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. Uh, yeah. And there, there it is. There I know was. you're fishing for it. I know. I know. Um, anything else? Hal, didn't you have a, a, a piece of homework? Didn't we throw something at you as well that you kind of like, like, I don't know if I, that's, that's me. I, I don't know if that's me. Yeah. I probably right. ducked it. Okay. That's Somebody fine. can find it. I'll look at it again. Yeah, that's all right. Well, so let's, let's do t-shirts before we get started. Let's see it, Sean. <laughs> Slight deviation from the tech theme today. Oh, love yeah, it. A good love it. For my birthday. Awesome. So, I, classic. Yes. Yeah. It's just important to have this one in rotation. The, the other, the new shipment showed up. So, that's the same shirt that Hal wears every show. I wonder if he Not actually changes show. his clothes. Does he, do you actually change your clothes, Hal? Mike, it's actually yes. a tattoo. <laughs> I heard, I heard he has eight of them, and they're always in rotation. I'm now fearful fearful of how much skin he was able to bring up forward. To the... Mr. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump in. Let's. So, Sean, you were you were good with uh, talking about number one here. Anybody else have any thoughts on uh, on the questions that asked? I mean, we'll, we'll kind of we'll go through the three that uh, Sean had kind of highlighted, and then we'll so we'll jump around off the list, if that's all right. I grabbed the low hanging fruit as quickly as I could. It's your show, brother. Yeah. So let's start with question number one. Um, so uh, I'm gonna butcher that name, but uh, yeah. Kuang Kuang says. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I had Office 365 page with domain name ABC previously. Uh, due to changes by the business, we would need to change the, the domain name to XY, XZY. 
it, it also must be changed for for SharePoint. As an example, abc.sharepoint to you know xyz.sharepoint.com. May you advise how to perform to change them? Um, well, there are, are a number of posts on people who want this. I mean, changing the domain name cascades through all sorts of things. Um, but there's somebody who did this and blogged about it, and I posted that link in the chat window as recently as February of this year. So this isn't old information. Um, and there is a actual user voice request where Microsoft had commented that this got the user voice request got over 12,000 upvotes. Wow. Um, and it's in the plans. So, so you're saying it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems yeah. many people no. think the same so, thing. So you're saying there's a chance. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a private program right now. At least it's in like preview uh, that this guy was able to take advantage of. And he linked to the user voice. Um, where this is detailed, but as far as changing your domain name, I would start by talking to Microsoft to see how they can help you with that. Because as mentioned, it goes way beyond just, you know, changing the domain name and seeing the change in SharePoint, it's going to cascade to absolutely everything and every workload. You think about things like OneDrive synchronization, you think about, um, uh, email being sent. Um, there's all sorts of email records that need to be changed. Um, so it's just not as easy as flipping a switch. Or rather, it's not as easy as flipping a switch and having things automatically or out automatically work. So those two links go through some good stuff. Yeah, we've had uh, a few questions. I think people have asked variations on this and of course we see kind of the other the sister problem of the multiple domains and how mm -hmm. to best manage that and moving between them and has some similar problems one of the yeah. things that i've always pointed out when i was working with with uh folks that were getting onto 365 or getting into azure was to plan that out because they always thought well we're just going to bring over you know our existing domain name or we're just going to put, you know, keep this on Microsoft.com uh, control domain, and we're going to have everybody go through that. Um, you re that's something you really got to plan because it's not, like Sean said, it, it ties to everything, first of all, you know, uh, but also it affects DNS. I mean, and we know what kind of animal DNS is. It's just, uh, you know, 48, 72 hours, two weeks, who knows, you know, um, so... Yeah, that's something you really you really got to plan for. And I understand you get you know you get bought by a company, you get merged, you get whatever. Um, that's happened before to other companies, and all you know a lot of them probably just migrate, you know, create a new domain, migrate all the stuff. It's you know until Microsoft comes up with a solution, which I mean that's going to be a monumental solution. Um, you know that might be the only answer. Yeah. Well, you mentioned domain to, or rather tenant to tenant migrations, and I've been a part of several of those over time, um, and they're more frequent than you might think. Um, people have to change everything up at once and start fresh and yeah. go to a new tenant, sadly. But. Well, you know, the other piece of this as well is, is especially if you are um, – Moving over, if you've got you know, historical SharePoint environments, if you've used Yammer, if you have you have these other components in place, uh, the naming conventions across all these different pieces, if you're doing any movement, any upgrade of any one of those pieces, that's part of that planning as well. And then to go and look at, hey, is this, is this the right domain or are we right. you know, integrating multiple domains in or multiple locations? And then ask those questions too. It's like, uh, are we going to... Uh, be in acquisition mode or be acquired or acquire another company later in the year. What happens then? What are the best practices? What? How are we going to handle each of those pieces? So, um, yeah, that's this. It's a it's it's bigger than just this one question. Advice: Retire before it's a problem. 
Well, no, and that's actually what I was going to say is I work with an insurance company that um, got acquired by a bigger insurance company, and one of the 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 sysadmins there was t- we were talking about the whole conversion process and getting all of their 365 stuff into the new tenant and all that kind of stuff. And anyways, uh, um, her her comment to me was, "Well, I'm pretty much guaranteed a job for the next couple of years." <laughs> yeah. yeah sad that it has to be looked at that way but yeah i guess that is a silver lining or more than a silver lining for some people job for life yep no no that's that's teaching and getting um tenure to college my wife has a job for life probably my goal that's 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 government my wife is county government so she's Mm. it's almost impossible to get fired from county government (laughs) <laughs> That's why I, my goal is to become a dictator of a small country somewhere in the world. I'm not that picky, <laughs> but it's it it's is, all about the job security, you know. Yeah, there, there's a couple of islands out there, you know, yeah. that uh, mm-hmm. you could pick up. Sure. Had any good interviews lately? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do any worse than some of them. There. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Uh, how about we'll jump down to get the other two, uh, Sean, since Sean has to leave 15, 20 minutes early. Let's get, make sure we get to his stuff first. Uh, number six. All about me. Um, Arnon asks, uh, I have office family, and I want to use autosave directly to my computer locally without using OneDrive. For some reason, the only option available is OneDrive. Does anyone know if this is possible and how it is done? That's your only option right now. You can yeah. go to SharePoint. You can go to OneDrive. but um, Use your words, Sean. <laughs> I included a nice link. Yeah, I've got the link. It's spelled out pretty clearly. In fact, this is this is the kind of uh, MVP response that really just kind of cuts to the chase. At the top, he says, "You can," and then it goes on <laughs> to explain new autosave feature was forced onto your QAT only works with OneDrive, and he talks about how autosave came to become. Uh, the thing that it is so he's got a little background there but the short answer the too long didn't read answer is sorry There's no way there from here arnon yeah you just set up the, the the sink so you've got it locally if that's the issue if you want to have them in that that one place but but right that's the sync engine it's OneDrive. so yeah well he's got office family so does yeah. he even have OneDrive on the back end with that Yes, he does. Does he know it? <laughs> that, I bet that, I can't tell you. So I guess the answer here, Arnon, is check out your OneDrive options. Um, I know you don't want to necessarily do that, but the way to backdoor this is if you can get it in OneDrive and you've got OneDrive, as Hal indicates you do, set up the sync client with OneDrive and synchronize it to a place on your local system. Then the sync client, or you can save to your local system individually and get it synced up to the cloud, vice versa, if you've got that sync client running and you do implement the backend storage. But no way to go straight from Office products to your local system with autosave. Right. All right. Um, do, do, do. That's a, it, it again. I, that just reminds me of like my favorite Jeff Teeper response of all time, which is simplify your requirements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, number eleven, Amanda. This is a longer question, multi-part question here. Um, so I have SharePoint site. Let's call it site A. Uh, that we are all going to uh, that we are going to delete, but we have two pages on that site that need to be moved to a different site. Let's call that site B. Site B. Uh, <laughs> those pages are instrumental for two other processes, and both have unique permissions and document libraries that were all created under the site A settings. I'm assuming when we actually delete site A, we lose those pages, the document libraries and permission groups, since they were created under that site. So my questions are, are correct. Is my assumption correct? And by deleting site A, we'll lose the pages, the document libraries, and the groups. It all goes bye-bye. Correct. <clears throat> now, 
Part two, is it possible to move the two pages over to site B without having to complete recreate them? That depends. The page is what they depend on. I mean, if you got a custom master page, this is the whole basis for migration software. Right. Um, you might be able to hack it with something like SharePoint Designer, but I sense from the way this is phrased and whatnot that you're probably not a regular SharePoint power user um, or somebody who would actually want to try anything in SharePoint Designer. Did you really just you're mentioning SharePoint Designer, really? I I mentioned it. I'll mention options. I am not <laughs> validating those whatsoever. <clears throat> I would do it next week is going to say Sean recommends SharePoint designer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think not. <laughs> but um, yeah, those pages, you know, you may see a, an individual page or two individual pages uh, when you go to it in SharePoint. The problem is those pages more often than not have uh, extensive dependency hierarchies under the hood. Like I was saying, master pages. CSS, JavaScript, share, you talk about custom permissions. Those exist at the top of the site collection, um, and those are used in your per custom permissions. Uh, so those have to be migrated separately. So you end up needing a migration tool to do it right. Um, there's the SharePoint Migration and Assessment Toolkit, the SM, the SMAT. I guess I should have gotten a link for that right off the bat which we can post in here. Um, and, but, and for those, just really quick background too, for folks that don't know, I mean, SharePoint people, we often joke about uh, SharePoint designer and and that look, it, a lot of people relied on it for a long time to go in there and make their, you know, customize their their sites to make it look more of what they, they needed and to create some basic, you know, automations that are out there. But the historically, what it was, was front page, that got rebranded. It got it actually had features stripped away and then rebranded and dedicated. Like the only people really using it were SharePoint. Like I remember when I was so I was at Microsoft from 2006 to 2009 and front page. Like I hated it for different reasons for the web stuff. Like all the crap that it would attach, the crap code. <clears throat> you could do something simple, and it forced me to go back and kind of refresh some of my HTML capabilities just because it was frustrating. The, you just you, you move one item, a line, you drag something, and it just throws in crap code. It just was really bulky, uh, just awful. Uh, and so that's that, that's some of the history that, that, that's there. So it's been, uh, you know, so it got rebranded as SharePoint Designer, used specifically for that purpose. And, and uh, it wasn't actually a rebranding. It was front page was split out into SharePoint Designer and Expression Web. So yeah, the, but expression was already something else. It got redirected over to expression. The expression suite was more than it wasn't. It, that was a, a, a it, it already was a, a separate product. In two thousand three, Aaron, I, I I don't have the complete history of of that of the expression suite because you know I was so into the expression suite, but <laughs> I'm. I'm pretty sure that express maybe not maybe the expression web was added to the other expression tools because they had the Adobe Light um, like the design tools the other aspects which were Focused part of the expression the suite so, stuff yeah. yeah so maybe maybe you're right on on that homework <laughs> this is an opportunity to prove me wrong that's just it he's going for the whole prove sean wrong angle on this not going for the kill not no. not giving information not giving no. valuable information yeah. what's fantastic about this so i so i know i just w had dinner at the vp who owned the expression suite uh this on saturday night and so i'm just gonna call bill another bill all Imagine the bills that. know the answer uh, now, he's and, now he's name dropping and, and so, <laughs> that's right mike well, there's only one bill he could possibly be calling. I mean, it could be anybody. That's true. But yeah. Well, you know what? I'm sure Bill Baer knows the answer to this question, too. I, I'm, I'll ask both bills. All right. Sorry. Uh, the 
Sean, I interrupted you. Part three of her question, is it possible to move the document libraries over to site B without having to completely recreate them? That's kind That's of the same answer. It. Yeah, well, that one is probably the easiest um, or the most likely to succeed. It'll depend on if you've got site columns uh, implemented in that list, uh, content types, but either way, I put the migration assessment toolkit link uh, in the chat window. That would be, if you're going for the cheap, try to get it done route, I would recommend looking at the migration assessment toolkit uh, as a first stop because it'll, um, it'll, recognize those dependencies. The whole point of me mentioning SharePoint um, Designer was because SharePoint Designer had the ability to leverage the uh, content deployment API and could generate an export package with dependency chains um, of items. So if you had a page and it happened to reference CSS and other things, that could be packaged into uh, an export file. And that file hypothetically could be brought into a SharePoint site. I don't think that works anymore for SharePoint online, but it would work between two on-prem sites. Yeah, but what you're talking about um, is, is, is still, uh, you're try still talking about standing up that those pages to look and function like they were on site A. The, the the part four of her question, is it possible to move the user groups over to site B? Uh, you know, it's like, well, yeah, you can go in and look at the permissions. You can put everybody who has access and set them up with the same permissions. The problem then becomes any of those automations or integrations that you have with site A, those don't, those sites don't change. Um, it doesn't automatically recognize the new. So you're still going to have to go and do cleanup to find all those other links and go transform those, uh, point them, redirect them to the new site, but the automations and retest them over and this is where you start to get into that situation of there's a lot of effort involved there. Would it have been easier just to migrate the content, the structure, and rebuild the automations? Yeah. And oftentimes the answer to that question is yes. yes. And a lot of organizations start at that point trying to bring the stuff over piecemeal. Um, invariably, something gets missed. Right. Well, that's why I, I think one thing that, I mean, having worked for Sean and I, both of us for two different, um, acquired by the same company, but we were working for two different um, migration, SharePoint migration ISVs, um, the whole idea, the concept of the iterative migration of moving a little bit, testing it, uh, and going back and look at this, that's that's one of the reasons why we, we strove for that iterative um, migration capability um, so that you could test out the site, test out those automations, uh, roll back pieces without having to move everything or giant portions across or seeing <clears throat> failures and not understanding why. So it, it allowed for better piloting testing out of that. Yeah, kind of like exact migration scenario. is an art, not a science. Right. It's the, yeah. What is it? it, it what does um, um, Snipe say in uh, uh, in Harry Potter? He says it's the about uh, uh, alchemy, about his uh, potions class. It's the the subtle science and the or, or the. I'm trying to remember. There's it was a great quote. Now I can't remember it. Okay, Somebody on. write down the date and time that Christian's quoting Harry Potter. <laughs> uh. Oh, if only there were there a source go. of all worldly knowledge at our fingertips. You had the quote? Um, I yeah, didn't go looking oh. for it. I saw that you were on it. Uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, it says you were... Uh, click on the link to open it. See, uh, you are here to learn the subtle science and exact art <laughs> of potion making. So <laughs> that's, that's what migration is. Exact yeah, that's a good way to put it. Exact art of migration. <laughs> that that's very spot on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll add that into the liner notes for uh, <laughs> the, the the notes. It's It'll be on the DVD that you can purchase. We'll have that purchasing information later in the show. Oh, and we will sell yeah. DVD readers with that. <laughs> that's right. 
All right, uh, Eric, I don't know if you had any questions that you wanted to focus on. Those are the three that Sean had. Oh. Beyond the meaning of life and all those. Otherwise, I'll go to number two. I'm fine yeah, no, I was I was with a client all morning, so I okay. was not able yeah. to review. No worries. Um, so, it Christina. Like it, was morning. Anyway. Yeah. I, it was a cloud. It was also a cloud morning. Yeah. I will now carefully enunciate all my words. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Christina asks, uh, I asked the other day about the iPhone calendar not syncing with Web Outlook. I understand that if I have the Outlook calendar as default, that solves the problem. But having said that, if I create invites from the default calendar in Outlook using the iPhone calendar app, it doesn't give you an option to add invitees. Why is this? Is there a workaround? I need my iPhone calendar and Outlook web to sync. I have an Android. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm useless on this. Yeah, so the, for, for me, so I, I see it in both places because my wife uses iPhone calendar. I don't. So it does the sync. Um, and, and so she can see the, those activities, but I'm using Outlook as my primary. So I'm just, I'm, I, I know that's not an answer. <laughs> well, it is an answer. It just, it is an answer. Yes. Not the one she's looking for. The desired one. This isn't the answer you're looking for. Yeah. No, I mean, this has been a common problem, right? With yeah. between mobile and desktop Outlook. If she's actually, is she using actual mobile Outlook? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Okay, so she's actually using the Outlook app, not the um, iOS the web. mail. Outlook web, so OA. Okay, so she's using on her phone, though. She's not using an app on her phone. She's using a web on the phone? Well, she's, I, that's yeah. a good question. We need more input because if it is the iOS mail app or the iOS calendar app, that's going to sync differently than the Microsoft Outlook app. And it's going to sync, you know, obviously, if you're using OA, then it's just pulling directly from Outlook.com. So there should be no difference there, um, you know, because that's the that's the source of all truth, right? I mean, it's what's out there in the cloud. So a lot of variables there. I mean, I've, I've seen people use the, the Gmail client to pull in, you know, Office 365 accounts, and that caused all kinds of headaches. Um, so... Well, I, I know that I've had some scenarios, and I and I and I apologize, I wasn't paying enough attention to know if it was because there's a combination of using, you know, web based in the browser, the desktop apps, and the phone, the mobile apps. But sometimes, where again, it wouldn't allow me to add invitees, but I could forward it and attach the people, add the people's names, forward them to that, and invite them that way. So that's that's a workaround for that scenario. But I don't know what combination of things that. Yeah. led to me not having the add add people to that calendar item but that's that's always the workaround is for the calendar item they'll receive it and if they then accept it and it forwards the, the that invite then uh house coming back in um then it kind of solves that problem okay uh can i do number five yeah let me awesome. uh, hang on. I'm just going to mark that one and jump down. So, Mr. Box, that sounds very personalized, uh, has a question about anomaly detection. Hi, I would like to detect anomalies across multiple fields that are not numeric. So, for example, looking for unusual Azure and sign ad sign in events using source IP, app name, account name, client name. To the best of my reading, Sentinel uh, uh, has time series analytic capabilities and can easily detect anomalies however only on continuous numeric field what i'm looking for is a way to perform anomaly detection from the event data where when the event, uh, event data is categorical so ip addresses account names rather than numeric splunk has a solution but he's looking for something that can happen with sentinel or any other pointers or guides yeah so <clears throat> The thing about the thing about Custo is, is it's just a query language. That's all you're doing is you're querying a backend um, and the log analytics data. Now, of course, you can access everything through the REST API or the you know the Graph API, which is 
you know, kind of like a REST API. Anyways, the in in the what you're looking for, what this particular scenario, what you're looking for is you're looking to change um, a numerical field to a string or to you know a, a, a different class object inside of a you know programming, um, and that's not an easy thing to do. So the way Splunk does it, I have no clue. I don't know how they go in and manipulate the data. They suck the data in. Once they have the data, they can do whatever they want to it. They can change, you know, context. They can change object classes. They can do whatever they want. So, you know, you need to take the data as is that's taken out of Sentinel via, you know, either the Graph API or, um, you know, direct custom queries and manipulate that oh, data yeah. on your end, not on... You know, you can't manipulate that data when it's inside of Azure. You have to pull it out, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and sometimes you, you know, changing a changing a numerical string to a to or I mean a, a numerical field to a, a string isn't that difficult. It's just now you've got to, you know, hunt down, you know, what what you actually want output. So you're not talking about a small project here, and I don't think there's an easy fix. I'm picking up a lot of background noise from. I'm hearing yes, fuzz. Maybe uh, somebody turned on a fan. Al's got the fan over his head. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, he just well, muted and it didn't change. Let me yeah, try me. Well, that that fan would have to be running high enough that paperwork would be flying around his uh, kitchen. <laughs> I think to. Me mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's still John, going. I muted and it's John, you tried muting. Weird. It's Riz. Is it me? It's yeah. always Riz. Now there's a vacuum cleaner going in the background, but that I'll sit on mute. No, that was Riz. You went mute and it's gone. What so anyways, yeah, to answer the question for uh, Mr. Box, um, you're going to have to do some custom code there as far as, you know, and it's it doesn't appear what you want is that difficult. I just don't know what kind of, you know, aptitude you have for coding for, for that type of uh, that type of work. Oh. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like something he's looking for a solution just from reading that that uh, is necessarily UI driven. Sounds like he's just looking for some advice and what to go and and build and pursue that. But yeah, you need to get good with these. Yes, regular expressions. Yeah, That's regular expressions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, not the same. Not the same, slightly different. Um, number three, Mirko asks, uh, my customer provision uh, Microsoft 365 groups, and with this Teams, and it was all run by the IT department. I'm going to paraphrase here. But he allowed other permissions for users, so owner permissions for users. With this, they could rename Teams and the group behind it. Is there any way to prevent this? Take away the permissions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's easy to give them. It's easy to take them away. Yeah. Don't give your end users owner permissions. Yeah, exactly. Now that, now that <laughs> yeah. being said, you can create custom permission levels that, you know, deal with individual granular uh, permission grants. That's the extensive over-engineered solution that might get you to what you want. But the easy thing is just pluck the ownership away from them, make them members. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, and I know a lot of smaller organizations that say, well, then, you know, I, I'm having to, to go in and do a lot more centrally where I want people to be able to kind of self-serve. And it's like, look, depending on the culture of your organization and what needs to be done, I mean, again, historically in the SharePoint space where 99.9% .9 of the issues that you experienced started with the permissions uh, and, and as the kind of the, the root, it's it's turning out to be that way with teams. It's why a lot of organizations are really excited about building out around the templates, having a formal provisioning process in place 
so that it is a more controlled consumption of the services uh, and that you can then go in and uh, and create uh, uh, roles for your users. Maybe you have members for everybody across the board, but you have a subgroup of people who are, have shown to be more trusted, they've gone through some training, and they might have heightened permissions in some areas, and they can create, they can add teams and take away teams and, and moderate and all those kinds of things. But if you're in an organization that has the wide open, everyone's an owner, anyone can go and create and trust, recognize that you then have to have a very robust and active community management model and that you're policing and correcting behavior uh, as you go. No more free range users. <laughs> but they're so delicious, Sean. <laughs> I was expecting something like that. Uh, I just like how they taste. I want those Costco corn fed with with uh, what else do they put all the all of the drugs that they pump into their their uh, their chickens. I want that that kind of like Costco problems. chicken. I'm using. We've talked about this in the past. Why I jumped immediately to that. Everyone knows if you've not purchased chicken uh, from Costco, it's uh, unnaturally just tasty and bulky and you can freeze it for six months and thaw it out and it's taste fresh it's not natural but it's delicious it's filled with um, attic freeze and i correct and i'm growing that third arm on the back i've talked about <laughs> it i'm not ashamed from all my genetically modified foods that's all right i'm i'm i've i've moved past it i've risen above it on your third leg <laughs> that's right all right. Um, number four, Adam asks, uh, I have linked my Windows 10 Pro laptop to Office 365 domain. Is there any way for users to enter a username instead of entering their whole email address to log into the computers? Um, well, unless... <laughs> well, <laughs> the answer is yes, but it's going to be a different account. I mean, if you're trying to log into a local account versus uh, something that's brokered by the cloud or Office 365, you may, I guess we need to know what your domain situation is. If you've got an on-prem domain that's being synchronized, if this is a personal laptop, um, many, if it was set up, you know, with uh, your standard UPN, which is typically your email address, um, then you're probably going to be logging in that way unless you create a specific local account for that person to log into. My understanding is that and when if you, you log in to do it that way, you're logging into the local machine, not the domain. Right. For But always used to be domain backslash username. Well, in my understanding is when you actually go through Intune and you uh, wow. set up a Windows 10 laptop, or a Windows 10 machine uh, through the AD join functionality, you have to specify the email address because that's mm -hmm. how the that's how Windows 10 identifies your tenant. It doesn't identify it with a domain slash username. Ah. So that's only with domain join AD domain uh, AAD domain join. So yeah, that's that's. Basically, we need more information. Right. You can still, I mean, those accounts, those machines, you can still log into a local account. Yeah, um, exactly. So. Yeah, and the only problem with that is that if you, if a user, depends on your support model, if the user has questions and they're going to contact Microsoft or another support org, and they don't know, you know, that it's that their email or whatever it could be confusing, but yeah. yeah, not so much. Who do you work for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know they can figure that stuff out, but yeah. yeah. So Adam, if, you've got, if you've got additional details, email us. Um, what is that email, Sean? Uh, 
That's a good question. What is He's that? got a look. <laughs> Office hours. Office uh, hours at collabtalk.com. Dot com. See, I need to have that little sound effect just to do the dot com. Who? The, I mean, that's stolen from who? It's. Uh, well, you start singing it, you'll know. <laughs> yeah. The cease and desist order. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't call uh, us. We'll call you. And I, I got a suggestion just real quick here, Christian. Yeah. Drew, when we have these longer questions, you know, maybe it might be worth actually putting the questions up on a screen. And having, you know, the actual people be able to read it rather than having to regurgitate everything, but having an actual, you know, having it up on the screen, which you can do. In an and instead of Riz, we put the questions right there. Yeah, and we put them right over his face and blur the back, the blur his face. And put it right there. That's a good suggestion. I, You know, I could do that and stick him on a on a PowerPoint and switch between the slides. And that would be easy for us to then to shuffle the questions in the order that we want to go through them as well. So a suggestion, and this is yeah. just a suggestion, uh -huh. you know, because you are the, the master, the maestro, the MC. Grand Poopa, um, that's what I yeah, prefer. Yeah, Grand Poopa, big cheese, head honcho, um, you know, Act all head. that. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, no, have, have, another, have another device log in. And have a fourth screen, a fifth screen up here that ha just has it, so you don't have to switch. Yeah. You know, just have that, just have it where the questions are up on the screen, and you can just, you know, if you have another laptop, I don't know, but you know, I'm assuming you do. I do. Um, yes. You know, you be able to do that. Figure you that use, out. Yeah. yeah, you could use OBS and do lower thirds too. That's true. Hey. Yeah. You, you can use the uh, like uh, game show host. You can use the Power Automate. Uh, built-in function in 365 that will take a list and just dump it out into PowerPoint as well. Mm. Yes. Sounds over-engineered. <laughs> take take simple list, put each one on slide. Okay. Okay. Next. Homework. With our short 27-step process. Homework. Add questions to slides. All right. Uh, <laughs> number seven. Another Windows 10 question. Uh, Jay Dutton asks, uh, when I first installed Windows 10, it somehow added my account twice. Since then, the computer will not turn off because it thinks the other account is still on. Both accounts are identical. I have to hold the power button down to turn it off. How can I get the extra account off? I've tried everything. So first of all... Hasn't tried everything technically in, because something is going to work. Yeah, in, uh, Jay, what is it, Jay Dutton? Um, yes. Jay Dutton, you're, you're technically incorrect. Um, they are not identical because these have separate GUIDs uh, or separate SIDs, if you will. But now you're getting real technical here. I don't yeah, know. Hashtag well, fake news, Jay Dutton. It's just a SID, man. It's just a SID. Leave it alone. Anyways, um, the thing is, is that I, I would I would place money that one of them is set up as a local account, even though it's got the same name or, you know, name at tenant name or tenant name slash whatever, but it's just Windows 10 has got it set as a local account and the other one's set as a domain account or a Azure AD account. The part of this that really boggles my mind is he can't turn the computer off. That's good. That I don't think that has anything to do with this. I mean, obviously that you know that doesn't. Not, yeah, I. Well, some, usually you just get a warning about if you turn this off, the other person's going to get disconnected and right. they're working and have to get saved. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Usually. But that other person actually has to log in, so there has to be another session, and you can see that in Task Manager, right? And you can go in there and you can yeah, click on the users tab. Five sessions. Yeah, and you can see the sessions that are going on. Uh, so. But so uh, Jay Dutton, to um, to confirm what Mike is saying, you would need to go into uh, users and groups in Windows and see if you have an account that's there under users. So careful about that, because most people with Windows 10, if they're not used to like Windows 7 or earlier, Windows 8 and earlier, is they don't know about users and groups because every time you try and go a user and groups, it takes you to the account settings, which is different than users and groups. So you want to go in through control panel, 
go into computer management and then go into local users and groups um, to find out exactly what users are active on the machine. If you go into accounts, it just it, it's too vague. It doesn't yeah. tell you all the details, you know. Uh, it's the, like the lightweight app. app on top. Of yeah, those. yeah. It's it's making it easy for folks who don't understand that. But going through control panel, and you should be able to find it there. Or but, just hit the go to hit start, and just start typing computer management as well if you can't yeah. find it. Yeah, yeah. Is there any difference if if with those two profiles, if he's logged in and primarily using? the non-administrator, maybe the other one's an administrator, any difference in what you just described if the other the other account is the administrator account? Uh, yeah, potentially. Um, but you'd still, turning it off, you'd still get that warning, like, oh, hey, yeah. you're going to turn off, but you can still proceed. Yeah. So things get a little bit more complex if he's running under an account. He, he needs at least one local account on his system in case something goes wrong and he's got to somehow recover. Um, because, you know, if you go into the recovery tools with Windows, you don't have a local account. That's um, not that's not told by Microsoft, though. That's ta- told by Sean, right? Because Microsoft doesn't doesn't tell people to create a local account as a backdoor. Well, they don't. They, they tell don't. people, to, no, 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 no. When they get a when you get a new machine, and it's in OOB mode, out of, bo- uh, out of box mode. When you start wear it up, it, it, it wants you to log in as a Microsoft account. It, it, you know, you have to find this little text in the bottom that says, you know, create offline account or create, you know, whatever. It's, you have to hunt for that. So they just want that one account that connects online and syncs everything between your computers and, you know, keeps everything in your Microsoft account. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's there. You're not actually, you know, told. Hey, you might want to create another account that gives you a backdoor in case something goes wrong. Okay, that's so, just good advice. But <laughs> yeah, it's you know that's from the old NT4 days. You have a local oh, account yeah. on the machine, and um, so yeah, what I'm advocating is not what I think you will hear from Microsoft. But if you talk to any Windows administrator, they're going to tell you you need a local account to do recovery and any sort of other operations that are not tied to online. Um, I think the place he wants to be is if you run NetPL is That's the users and groups management. What is it? I'm sorry. NetPL is N-E-T-P-L-W-I-Z. I don't know about that. Well, maybe it is. Um, that's one place. I'm I mean, thinking yeah. of the old, you know, the yeah. one that's got the tree view in the left. Yeah, the users and groups. Yeah. So, yeah. But if you, so anyway, what I was saying is if he does not, if he's running under an account that doesn't have local admin rights or is an administrator, and will he even be able to wipe out the local account that is? I don't. He has think to so. be. No, he has to be an admin on the machine. Now, you could have a, a, a online account that's an admin. It all depends on. He has to go in and find out who's admin and who's not. So if he goes into users and groups, he goes into groups, he goes into local administrators or into administrators, and then you'll be able to see, you know, obviously what account is part of that group. Um, and that that account he has to go into and then he can wipe out the other group. So Jay Dutton, I don't think we have a very simple answer for you. In fact, I don't even think we've got a moderately simple answer for you. It's It depends on too many things. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of variables here. I mean, number one, make sure that you can actually see both accounts. Go into users and groups. Don't go into the account settings. Go into user groups. Make sure you can see. Find out what account is actually administrator. And if the account that you want to keep is administrator, you're golden. Go out and delete the other account. Simple as that. Um, If the account that you want to keep is not administrator, then you have to find that account in the users and groups. Right click on it. Go to group membership. Add it to the administrator groups. Get back out. Log in as that user and then kill the other group or the other user. And then you're only going to have one user on that machine. 
Now, caution. Once you get rid of that user, you're going to lose all of their settings. You're going to lose all their files. They're going to use, I mean, they're gone. So if you got anything in the downloads directory, the documents directory, anything like that, gone. <laughs> I, I was just going to call this like um, Mike has recommended the Logan's Run approach. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know? Of course. Are the other users flying around that they explode in a, the yeah. fireworks and lights. Renewal. <laughs> Renew. You know? It's a little, it's the little heart plug light that's, uh, that's you know, beep, beep, they're red. Time to eliminate them. <laughs> I, I like referencing modern, like very in the now movies, like Logan's Run. All right. <laughs> in the now from 20 years ago. <laughs> there are a lot of users saying Logan's what? Are you talking yeah. about Wolverine? That's it. Yeah. And it, I always like that uh, that scene too with the the ice robot thing. It's it's one of those cases. It's like running away from the blob in the movie where the people are like ah ah they fall to the ground ah ah it's like ah ah yeah and five minutes later the blob overruns them. That's or a yeah. fish called Wanda. Oh. Ken's gonna k- kill me. You're <laughs> <laughs> gonna whack roller. her. You're gonna whack her, Ken. Ken. Oh, oh my dead. God, he's gonna whack her. Deadpool, you know, chasing the guy with the uh, Zamboni. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Will asks the question number eight. I'm trying to understand why the new Microsoft List object couldn't be better accomplished with a shared Excel file containing a table. Is there something better about a list? I mean, because sharing an Excel file via email, and you know, why isn't that better? And I'm I'm gonna Sherry. I'm gonna Sherry write a strongly, here. yeah. I'm going to write a, a strongly worded letter and send it via first class to Will. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. So why would somebody use the new Microsoft lists and not just an Excel file with a table? Well, let's see. Check in, check out, version history, permissioning, all sorts of extra wowie zowies. I'm just thinking. So the more functionality. Yeah. More functionality. Yeah. Bottom line. Will more functionality. Love it. Live it. Go with it. <laughs> Mike Nelson's life <laughs> lessons. <laughs> and that that movie reference is so much newer than Logan's <laughs> Run. So <laughs> um by like what, five years, <laughs> six years? <laughs> Not even. <laughs> Uh, uh all right uh caro the green um uh, this is a good question it's like uh you know is there a way to share a file in office 365 for hours so first of all is that could be carothagrin but you it know you, you can call it whatever you like there yeah. you know that's carothagrin 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 yeah yeah Carrots um, green. Yeah. Carrots green. There you I go. I think the max limit in, in OneDrive is three hours, isn't it? For a share? The I min mean, limit? Yeah. Am I right on that? Or I thought there was a, uh, you could set a limit on a shared file, but there was like a, a one hour or a three, uh, three hour. And I don't remember what the other settings were. So the way to share it for the only the period of time that you want is to send people the sharing link. And when you're done with it, move the file somewhere else. So am I thinking, I thought there was a time limit. Maybe I'm thinking of like Citrix share file because I can actually set a time limit on those files. Um, I don't know. I mean, said it's possible or not. I've never set, well, set a limit on anything that I've ever shared that way. So that's neat. Sean, that's just mean. <laughs> what, remove the file? Yes. Well, if you I want to share it for 15 minutes. Go. At the end of 15 minutes, you move the file. That's, that's definitely a life hack. Yeah, that is totally a hack. If I right-click on a file, which I'm doing right now, and I go share, and I do the... Change, set an expiration date. So you can set an expiration date, mm-hmm. um, but you can't set a time frame. So 
You think it may be IRM, Mike? Azure information? No, uh, no, no, no. I, I'm thinking on uh, another service outside of Microsoft. I think a Citrix share file oh um, allows you to do that. But I'm uh, trying to understand what Karatha Green or Carol the Green, uh, I, I, whatever, Carol He Green. Yeah, there's only one one L in there. Car no, it's not even an L. It's a Get carrot. stuck on the name. Carrot. It could be carrot. All right. Um, <laughs> As so, we insult our users. <laughs> yeah. Well, share file for hours in Office 365. Where? where help me, guys. Where do you got? Where do you share file in 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 Office 365 except for OneDrive? Yeah. Well, well, you can you can share from the individual Office applications, but it's essentially it's sure. it's just a it, it's a yeah it, it's a OneDrive for business, so it's. SharePoint yeah. OneDrive capability. So it's the same feature. I mean, all I see time? is the ability to set it for, yeah, I can see that I can set it for, but it, the the least amount of time I could set it is end of day tomorrow. Yeah. I, that's it. There is no hour setting. Yeah. And now I'm looking at, I'm looking at, and just to competitive from a competitive standpoint here, Citrix ShareFile allows you to set actual minutes. So you can actually say it's only available for 10 minutes. It's only available for whatever. So, so for the five people that use that, fantastic, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, no, I mean that's a good that's a good point. I I don't think I have not seen that that level of granularity anywhere. Dropbox Microsoft. and Dropbox. Yeah. yeah, Dropbox allows you to do that. Yeah. I'm looking in Dropbox right now. Is it Box or Dropbox? One of them allows Dropbox. you to do that. I know Dropbox. Yeah. I just, just search became minute aware of there, sharing. there's a new Dropbox app, which obviously I knew. Well, I know I just deleted it off my system. I realized that I was paying for it for years. It came up for renewal, the annual, and uh, the the vendor design vendor that I worked with is the last one. I had one client two years ago, and this design vendor that I've not worked it with in over a year, that. Uh, I needed to use Dropbox, but I just I've not needed it. It yeah. lost a lot of market share, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, except from people like me who have lots of shared files in Dropbox, and if I right. change them, they're going to break tons of links, and that's more of a pain to fix up. Yeah. It's called, I just it's called being lazy. <laughs> being lazy. <laughs> I guess number 10 right. Christian all right number 10 uh, is Windows Media Center ever coming back and that's from Kingman mp4 so someone not. that has mp4 in their ID um, and he <laughs> stuck on that that various technology you know, Kingman but. mp4 you need to look at Plex or no you need to look at I mean I got to tell you, this is a this is kind of a pet peeve for me because when Microsoft starts promoting Groove music, yeah. that is the absolute. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that should go away with the Zune. It should just disappear. I know you're going to pull it out, Christian. I knew I know you, you, were you are. Going I had I, it ready to go. <laughs> it's like Rob Foster's foot. Zune. That you, Zune just comes out. Groove music was one yeah. of the wor one of. The many worst decisions that they've made. <laughs> or, is, is something happened to that? Is that getting retired, or am I just uh, wishful? I hope so. It's, nobody <laughs> I hope it. so. No, but you know, Windows Media, media uh, uh, Center. Well, the. You know, you know, now you're so, talking. You're talking about the whole thing here, not just the player. I know, yeah. not just the player. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the player, of course, is still there. I use it still. So. Yeah, but this is the encoder. You right. know, the whole bit. So. Is there like an open source version of that? For the, of the media center? Uh, I don't know that. I mean, you can do everything in a, you know, you can't have the visualizations and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure Winamp, you know, Winamp can do encoding. Um, yeah, you can visualize everything. Um, but it can't do, you know, I think Winamp can even do video now. Yeah. Um, so. well, actually, it's been able to do it for a while. Yeah. One of those guys who paid to support Winamp. Oh, and they're going to be releasing a new Winamp. It's being renewed. Somebody actually is saving it. Awesome. If you go out to Winamp, they're making some noise about that. So, 
Here's my I'm um, sharing on screen my uh, my Zoom app. Oh Still my god. <laughs> ABBA. Yeah, you got ABBA there. I see that. Yeah. I have yeah. thousands of yeah. yeah. It's but as you can see, it's it's not letting me scroll. It's like uh, I don't know what's going on there, but yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna put a link in the chat window how to install Windows Media Center on Windows 10. <laughs> you can. People have done it. And you can actually pull the XP version. That's what you have to do because it died in XP, right? It was it in that time frame, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like the games, right? Because people like the old solitaire game. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. The one from, what was it called? Spider, Spider or something like that? Spider Solitaire. Uh, Spider Solitaire. Yeah. And people love that. And when Windows 7 came out, they got rid of it. And now somebody went back and backported it. So now it'll actually run on Windows 10. I think a component of that was part of um, one way you could get away with it a little longer is if you had a Windows home server. Yeah. 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 Whatever That's happens, I miss. Windows I, home server. It's funny, the old games I was thinking about. So I, I, I miss, I was oh. thinking the other day I, that I miss my old, uh, grew up with a, with a Mac and uh, in high school and um, had for years, but uh, was the Reversi game. And of course, there are versions of it you know, everywhere, but. My, Minesweeper, man. Minesweeper was the bomb. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good phrasing there. All right. Um, Susan, number 12. Uh, and how are we doing on time with you, Sean? Just want to be. I was going to say, I'm going to need to pull out of here just in a second. Go ahead and go through Susan's and all. Susan asks, uh, hi, anyone know if Whiteboard will be part of the Microsoft 365 groups? So the team who has a Teams uh, can all see the Whiteboard used, or is it only on our personal profile and we'd have to share? In user voice. Yeah, there's I uh, I don't know if one of you can find the link to that, but yeah, Susan, that is... Uh, there are a lot of requests around whiteboard. A lot of people using Teams say, "Why, why can't this be a shared?" You forced Wiki as a tab upon us, but why can't you give us something actually useful like the whiteboard as an automatic tab? I'd be all for an automatic tab within a new team that's created. Your uh, workaround for that, Susan, is uh, shared OneNote, right. uh, which will typically update in real time, so you can actually achieve the equivalent. Uh, right now without specifically whiteboard right but if you're doing a meet running a meeting you can always uh, share the screen uh, and and do some live editing on there people want to be able to have the co-editing multiple things moving around with a little of their name or their initials or something around who's doing the edits yeah, so uh, yeah there's a lot of talk around that there's stuff out in user voice um, I don't know time frame for this but um, you know, uh, third-party apps too. There's two of them: yeah. freehand and uh, code by Vivani that uh, do it. Yep. There's a lot of movement happening around that, so a lot of people asking for that. <sighs> well, guys, it's been fun. I got to drop off. Uh, I guess the show can end now, right? John's leaving. <laughs> oh, just we're, we're just saving up all the homework assignments for him. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the danger of dropping early. Oh, it was an active last 15 minutes. You've got 14 assignments. Yeah, funny how that works. Yeah. Well, we uh, got through, have... what, 12 questions in the first hour, and we need to get through another 20 in the last 15 <laughs> minutes. So that will lead to a lot of assignments. Yeah. yeah see where sure. this is going. Have a good rest of the day, guys. Hey, thanks Sean. a lot. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so number 13, Robin. Um, I just want to verify a few things before migrating our email system. I hope you'll help me clear up these questions in my mind. One, do I need to remove DMARC, DKIM, and SPF records before adding additional DNS records for Microsoft 365 Exchange? No. No. Huh? And if so, can I delete those records and add them again just in case we're going to revert in our previous email system? So. See, reference previous answer, please. <laughs> all of the above <laughs> no those records do not need to you don't need to do anything with those uh 365 is smart enough it uh don't worry about them okay 
Uh, let's see. Luca asks, um, can I recover and download the files attached to a group chat? I need to import the documents added from the user to the chat in another program. So you're having a chat. People have added a bunch of attachments to that chat. Is there a way to mass download those items? Uh, anything you put into a chat, doesn't it go into the files for the for the team? Not for a chat necessarily. Oh, I uh, thought it automatically well, got discussion. added. That's for a conversation. Yeah. Oh, I thought it act when you were doing it in a group, it automatically got added to the files. I got okay. I'm wrong. Yeah. No. Anything that happens within a chat is uh, is personal. It's it's separate from all the rules that apply to a threaded discussion. The chat okay. over in a channel. And then the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> it would be one, one by one, right? I, I'm not aware of anything else. You also can't share within a chat. You can't share content from a channel. You have to upload it directly from your PC. Now, see, that's different than Slack because Slack you can actually share share from a channel to a private chat, and uh, from a private chat to a channel as long as you're given you give permissions. So. Yeah, what would be, uh, Eric, any thoughts on what, what's the kind of the governance, the thinking, the security thinking around not allowing that sharing to happen between chat and channel conversations? Well, I mean, there's there's a bunch. I mean, so all of that was put in place long before the, I mean, from an architecture perspective, all that was put in place long before the private channels existed. So people were using chat sort of in place of private channels, sometimes without knowing and other times doing it intentionally. So it was it was intended to share information one to one, which was not previously shared through any other mechanism. My guess is as they as they start to make changes, and that's not one that needs to be done urgently, obviously, because you're just you know, you would if I was chatting with you, Christian, I would send you something and then I would send it to the group elsewhere if if you know it was for public distribution. Um, so I think it was really just a privacy type of issue initially, and that'll change in time because it is a pain. If I go to, to share something with you, I have to do it intentionally, independently from my PC and then send it to you. So if, if, if I didn't have the original file or it was sitting in a conversation somewhere and I wanted to comment on it with you, I wouldn't be able to share that. I'd have to download it and then re-upload it, which is just yeah defeating the purpose. Well, but I... It, as, as the initiator of a chat, if I had the ability to not allow, maybe by default it allows for sharing, but I could toggle off and not allow anything that is shared, uploaded into a chat anywhere and control it that way. But most things, uh, you know, if you and I are having a conversation and we're editing something and it's ready for prime time, we've kind of moved through the you know, the idea formation and we're ready to share it over in that channel discussion, why wouldn't you be able to just to move that across? Other than the fact that it's located, the content itself, is it a place that is a, a, a private channel, personal, you know, OneDrive or something? Um, and, uh, and I don't want people co-editing or you know, the permissions are just different from that location than where the content will reside within that channel. Right, but the, big, the bigger issue is what is the discussion? Right. So if you and I are chatting, I mean, it comes down to governance of what people are using chat for. The idea behind chat is to have, in my humble opinion, um, quick sidebars that have nothing to do with anything at a project level or at a business level, which, you know, invite you somewhere else. Hey, Christian, do you have five minutes? Let's go into it. Let's go talk about this client. Um, and, and therefore, all the information is independent of a particular channel or a particular client. As soon as you're talking about, you know, it's like email, right? You, you write an email just between you and I. We can go back and forth 100 times before we talk about a specific client. But once we're talking about a client, you want, you know, information that's going to be referenceable and threaded and contextual within the, the context of that specific client. Maybe, except for when uh, Sean, Mike, Hal, and I talk about you specifically, we don't want, you know, we want to have that conversation, and then we have the attachments 
that eventually we might want to have public, but not the conversations. Right. No, but to, to your point, like I get that, the sidebar conversations. Um, but from the attachments, I look at differently than the conversations, the, the chat conversations. I think there's a reason why you peel off and go have a sidebar conversation because you don't want it to be part of that historical record. It might not be relevant, might be more personal stuff, you know, um, where we're talking about Sean directly and Mike and Hal and you and I, just like we do every week. This is all um, being recorded, though, so it's kind of all for <laughs> naught when you think of no, it. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. But the uh, but the uh, the the documentation itself again it might might be that we go through several iter iterations the two of us and then just want to easily move that over it's so it's just an additional step of having to save that down and then re-upload that but the difference there is that it then becomes where you when you upload that a that new that public version that you know version one or you know uh, or the the pilot plan or whatever that is over in that other location, then you just need to go in and do I need to now delete it um, from that, my personal OneDrive, which is what I was sharing, what we were collaborating on before. So it can add to some duplication of that content, but it does enforce that the content is where it's supposed to be, to be managed properly by having that separation. Right. Correct. I had a, a the call that I got off before I was I jumped in here was with a, a government client and they were asking all kinds of questions about Microsoft Teams and and how I should I should write in under an alias, uh, let's say Sean McDonough and ask this question. But the, the question was all about Freedom of Information Act requests. So the ability for anybody in the general public to pull a government agency and say, well, what's all the, the referenceable information pertaining to this specific issue? And they're asking questions around, well, can you, you know, is anything that's written into a channel Freedom of Information Act accessible? And then what about a chat? And then what about a stream recording? Because a stream recording is going to spit out a transcript. And does that become a matter of public record? And from that perspective, it's messy, right? Because mm -hmm. the I mean, the easiest thing to say is, yeah, it's all FOI accessible. And then their question is, well, if that's the case, then how do we communicate otherwise? And my answer is I, I'm not answering that question. You know, communicate any way that you want otherwise. But if you're using Teams, based on where the information is going, whether it's going into SharePoint or whether it's going into a chat file somewhere, all the information lives and exists. So if you're worried about an FOI, then you need to create your own workaround. Well, this kind of goes into a question we answered last week or week before last uh, about uh, Compliance Center and, and whether in chats, whether they're searchable. And what we had kind of discussed was the fact that an admin can't go in and look at the content of, I, like I can't go in there and say, as the as your admin, Eric, I'm going to go check out like the last 10 conversations, the chats that you have with the 10 people uh, within Teams. It's not I can't look at it that way. However, because you are an employee and this is a, in a company asset, you know, this system and the conversations that are happening on company property, this environment. And this is where that you know, FOIA request would come in. I, I would look, it's all searchable. I can go in as an administrator and do a search on intellectual property on certain keywords. And from that, you would be able to find conversations that are happening within chat. I can't just go in and find like a database around that, but I can go in and find references to and uh, and, and conversations that are happening, yeah. uh, you know, that way. So it's, 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 um, what's well, the, it's, it's, um, you know, the lines are kind of blurred for that privacy and, and uh, as far as access to the content. But the rule of thumb should be that if I'm on my company's Microsoft 365 environment anywhere, I don't own that content or that conversation. That's the way I look at it. There is no privacy to any of that. It might be more difficult for the administrator to get to some of that content, but all of it's accessible. Yeah, not not an incorrect way of looking at it. But if you are the if you're the X, right? If you're the CEO, the VP, whatever, that's not the way you think about it. That's not how you communicate. If if you are 
someone whose whose world is going to be uh, upended by an FOI request, then that's how you look at it. You say, well, you know, anything that I do or touch, uh, you know, it's like it's like I don't know, recording something and having it live forever. You know, anything that we say here is referenceable. But if we if we end the recording and talk about something and then restart the recording, well, then you know, did that conversation really happen? Who knows? Yeah. Answer your phone, Fletch. <laughs> oh, there, uh, goes, there goes Hal. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Hal got the Fletch reference, and Mike yeah. is busy doing some sort of surgery there. So. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I apologize. I got an emergency email, so I'm just responding. Sorry. Not at all. Well, we might, well, one more, possibly two more questions here. And uh, Eric and I might be able to field these. Uh, Susan asked another question. Uh, so it, it, with an E3 license, a Microsoft 365, talking about Teams, can I release an app in Teams for only for one of my teams? Uh, you know, any PowerShell or such, or as in the admin console, I can only release for all. Sorry, you lost me there with the apps and the adding. Yeah, so so if I can, <laughs> what the whole the whole uh, thrust of the question? Yeah, no, the uh, so the. Well, I just want to make sure I understand the question so I answer it correctly. So the the issue is that when you uh, as an admin for Teams over your organization and you allow an app to be used, you can't you know can you restrict it to one team or do all teams get it or no teams get it? Right. Can you take it back? <laughs> well. So you know, can you limit the apps in a specific team? And my understanding is how I'd answer that is, well, that's up to each of the teams, the team owners. You know, let's say you have, let's simplify in your organization, 10 teams and 10 different people own each of those teams. The admin, the, the, the Microsoft 365 admin allows the app in, but the team owner can elect to allow that that app to be used within their team or not. Yeah, that sounds about right. And but so you just mod is it more of a moderator versus a control? Well, first of all, apps are at the channel level, not necessarily the team level. So you you can decide and define based on the channel who has access and who doesn't. Now, if the question is within within the channel, within the app, who can use it at that level? That's that's something I'd have to get some homework done and, and around and get an answer to. So you want so you're you're signing up for some homework then, Eric? Sean actually raised his hand. I saw it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that's that's uh, it's a good question. I, yeah, I don't so, know the answer. I, I mean, I, I so I believe, it, and I'll go back and look at it. But I I thought that was it is an all or nothing. It's enabled or it's not, uh, and then uh, and then you have to do that that channel management, that community management aspect of it to police it whether you allow it to be part of the collaborative activities within that team and those channels. That's my understanding. But uh, Sean will go and clarify for us. Mark that one down as a Sean assignment. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> um, Sean assigned homework to investigate. I'm going to mark this to do. Mike, Mike looks all focused, and all of a sudden he gets this smirk and he looks up and nods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, number 16, rupee one, two, three. Uh, Windows hangs randomly and touchpad freezes. So my Windows 10 is hanging randomly for every half an hour. And the touchpad also hangs for some second and becomes normal. My system has clean Windows, 8 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 8 gigabytes, uh, 512 SSD purchased just 10 days ago. Any idea why that might hang? A lemon of a laptop? Lots of lots of ideas. But There's nothing. just a whole bunch of things that could yeah. be involved with there. How hot is it? <laughs> Seriously, that's one of the things that these surfaces that I've like that I've got to do. If they get if they get too hot, there is a throttle 
there's a processor throttle, and I, that, that's why I've got this little lovely fan blowing on the back of the machine while I'm sitting here doing this, because there is enough activity in running it. And they blame me for having some sort of background noise. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt that, but, but 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 no. The point the point being is I've had I've had teams completely crash on me when the machine gets hot enough. So I mean, that's well, one I've of had teams crash. Things. I've had teams crash on me. It has nothing to do with how hot the machine is. That's a totally yeah. different question. Well, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah, there's there's a million things that you could you could check there. Um, I mean, that's not a terribly powerful machine to begin with, but it certainly it shouldn't just hang for for you know, endless periods of time. I would check things like OneDrive. Do you have OneDrive sync, you know, happening? And um, how much content is it syncing at a time? Or how much information are you are you editing? Pull Task Manager up and leave it on the screen yeah. and see what it does. Yeah. Well, and, and saying that you've got a gig, gig, gig of RAM and, and that, you know, 512 hard drive has nothing to do. It could be in, you know, yeah. uh, an old processor and machine, but uh, you know, same thing. If you've got a dozen things that are open, the touchpad not responding. I mean, all of that kind of points to a memory issue. So if you have twenty uh, Chrome tabs open and Teams running, there you go. Yeah. Guys, I got to hop here. Yeah, Thank we're for, we're, uh, we're at the time anyway. Today. So thanks a lot, mm -hmm. Eric and. And uh, appreciate everybody for joining. This was episode 26. I didn't mention that at the beginning. Episode 26. Oh, well. I know. So we will not be back tonight, but we you can continue to ask questions. Send them to uh, office hours at collabtalk.com, and we'll address them. Otherwise, we're picking up questions from the Facebook uh, groups, the Office 365 community, as well as the Microsoft Teams community out on Facebook. And uh, you can find this recording out on uh, YouTube under you know, YouTube's WAC C, WAC Collab Talk. So my company page, just go look for Office Hours, and as well as on BuckleyPlanet.com. And I provide a complete link list of every topic that we cover in order so that you can uh, uh, go in and jump to that part in the video. So we're now at this uh, every week, every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific. So we'll see you back next week. And thank you, gentlemen. And I'll be... Uh, I believe I'll be here for this because uh, I head out to uh, the North American Collab Summit, I think, Monday afternoon. So I'll be there in person. My only other my, – my last event, in-person event, was in February. So I'm looking forward to going, going out to Missouri. Yeah. So all right, gentlemen. Thanks a lot. We'll talk okay. to you soon. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yep.